Hello, and welcome to the Boise Art Scene Podcast. My name is Morgan, and in an effort to bring more artists to more people, I've decided to shift my focus to podcasts and reels on Instagram. I hope the longer-form interviews will help you get to know the artists I speak with better and allow me to branch out into some of the less visual art forms I've previously avoided. This project has always been a learning experience, and as I get more comfortable and confident in this new format, things will continue to improve. The artists and the audience are who I'm doing these for, and I would love to hear feedback about what you'd like to see more or less of. I also want to remind everyone out there that we have a Patreon, and if you're able to donate to the project, it's always appreciated. You can also reach out with comments or questions through my website, boiseartscene.com. I hope you enjoy my interview with printmaker Tom Callos. Tom is a retired martial artist with more than 50 years of practice. He decided to shift his focus from physical to visual arts after fracturing his leg in a training accident. Tom found mastery of martial arts through repetition and seeks to do the same in his printmaking. Tom set out to create a thousand portraits, believing an old martial arts adage that until you've done something a thousand times, you haven't really tried to learn it. Tom likes to focus his work on people who he considers to be upstanders in their lifetimes and has recently worked on a series called People of Boise, where he features local upstanders. Can you tell me your primary medium? I work in relief printmaking, which is uh, a surface is carved, inked, and the paper's laid upon it, and the surfaces can be different, linoleum or vinyl or wood, but mostly I'm a relief printmaker. And uh, what got you interested in working in that? Well, I like paper. Somehow paper attracts me. So I was collecting postcards and interesting uh, advertisements when I was running businesses. And I'd think, oh, I want to model that or I love the colors here. And I was I gravitated towards paper things. And then uh, I liked people. And so uh, doing portraiture of people in relief printing gave me a chance to work with paper to, to research the lives of interesting people and to recreate them. And, uh, but mostly I had a friend on my, I used to be in a performance troupe and we traveled the United States and the world giving martial arts performances that had comedy. And eventually uh, we went into television and movies, but uh, one of my classmates was a, a printmaker, uh, amateur, but we ha- had a lot of sitting around to do. And so one day he brought some extra tools to me and he started to show me how that he was doing these line of cut prints and took me about 20 more years to get serious about it. But it, it planted a seed in my head. How long have you been working then uh, doing these line of cuts? Well, I started doing some basic printmaking about uh, 20 years ago and I do something once or twice a year when, you know, I was raising children and working. But in the last eight years, uh, I've been pretty serious about it, uh, mostly caused by a spiral fracture of my right femur as I was getting ready to prepare to fight in the Jiu-Jitsu World Championships for old guys called the Masters. And I'd already had two hip replacements, and uh, but they, they my hips were working fine, or so it felt. And uh, you pre-register for this event, so I saw who I was going to fight. And one of the guys was a judo champ. And I said, oh, you know, I better get ready. So in the next workout, I spiral fractured my femur and went from five to seven days a week of two or three hour training to sitting around, you know, thinking about was I ever going to be the same. And at that point, I picked up my tools and I said, I I need something to keep me from going mad. And coincidentally, art, making art to me puts you in the same mindset as you need to be a good fighter. Uh, You need to block out the future. You need to forget about what's happened and focus on the present moment. And so I get the same kind of relief from relief printmaking that I got from serious, aggressive uh, professional training. Uh, So how did you learn to do the line of cuts? Well, uh, I went to some workshops and uh, I was just talking to somebody about the best advice that I ever got in a workshop. And that was... uh, it was a woman named Phoebe Tolan, who's a well-known printmaker, and I was taking a class from her in Sacramento. And I, I said, Phoebe, what are the rules? And she said, there's no rules. And if you find one, break it. And so I just started experimenting. And uh, in studying and practicing the martial arts, there's a kind of a, a set point of a thousand reps. If you've done a thousand reps of something, you've started. You're not a master of it, 
but don't even talk about the fact that you've invested your time until you've done a thousand reps. It's common among my peers. So I set out to do a thousand portraits and then I'm in about 500 right now, but it, it, I've learned along the way and I'll do portraits that I know won't sell, that nobody knows anybody, but I, it's just practice. It's like going to the mat, you know, sometimes you're the hammer, sometimes you're the nail. No one workout changes your life, but collectively over an extended and long period of time, you start to figure things out. And that's what I've been doing. So I don't get too hung up on who I do or who owns the rights to the photos I use as a model because I'm not doing it to create a masterpiece. I'm, they say that uh, luck is opportunity meeting preparation. And that's what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out how to use the materials involved and the, get through the whole color spectrum and figure out which lines give and which lines take away. And I don't know any other way to get really good at something without repetition. And I used to teach my students and they'd all repeat after me. I'd say the repetition and they'd all say the mother of skill, you know, is it's just transferring. It's taking what I did on the mats and taking it out of the dojo and putting it to work at other things. And that's, that's kind of what Miyamoto Musashi said was a famous samurai wrote the book of five rings. He said, when you master one thing, and I'm paraphrasing, you have the same tools to master anything. And I, so I'm, I really approach art as a martial artist, understanding the value of practice because of all the years that I put in, which were about 50, the one thing that I squeezed out of it, the essence of what you get from all that training is that you start to understand the power of transformation that is uh, held in practice. So that's what I'm doing. I practice every day. If sometimes I do really well, other times I flop, but it, neither one of them really uh, affects me too much because I have my eyes on something down the road and this is part of what you do to learn how to do it. So, you know, and a lot of artists say, well, I tried that. And I often think, well, how many times did you try it? Because if you haven't done it a thousand times, you haven't tried. Well, when I talked with uh, Noel Weber, uh, or Noel B. Weber, uh, <laughs> He's got his son has the same name, so they differentiate by the middle initial there. Uh, but when when I spoke with him, you know, he said that he never considers anything that he does a failure. It's it's all yeah. practice. Yeah, there's a saying: you you win some, you learn some. Uh, so, you know, you kind of touched on it, uh, but as you were talking, I was thinking of a question of, you know, do you think that that discipline that you had to have as a martial artist has translated into your ability to progress quickly as an artist? I have nothing else to blame it on. You know, I really didn't have, I only awoke to art in my twenties when I, I, one time I walked into a furniture store and they had a big print of a Raoul Dufy. And I thought, who did that? It was like, I just saw art for the first time, you know? And, uh, but I, I don't have any other way to blame anybody or anything. It's martial arts uh, practice that taught me how to apply myself. And, you know, martial arts practice is a great metaphor because it's painful, you know. It isn't always pleasant. You know, somebody's trying to choke you, you're defending. I mean, it's vigorous and it's stressful. And you have to train yourself to love what you're doing despite you're getting crushed by some... 400 pound kid who wants to be a UFC fighter. And, you know, you're, I'm in my fifties, you know, I'm 180 pounds. You have to learn to like the practice. Cause if you don't like the practice, you won't be there a year from then. You know, you having had martial arts schools, I really worked to teach people how to stick to the game long enough to realize the benefits. And I think that arts like that, you have to, in my viewpoint, you have to stick to it long enough and make enough mistakes that you start to make things that transcend the normal, you know, that transcend the ordinary. Yeah, when I was in high school, I did uh, martial arts for a bit. Um, cause our PE options were we could do uh, Kusul Wad, which was a Korean yeah. martial art, yeah. or we could do dance. Uh, or we could go over to the regular high school and do regular PE. Uh, so I, choose, I chose Kusul. Kusul. Uh, once I moved here to Idaho, the only place that did it was there was a guy out on the Mountain Home Air Force Base who taught it. And that was 
you know, two hours away from me. So yeah. I, I kind of fell out of practice with it. Well, um, Cook's was big in the Bay Area. You know, they were based out of San Jose and, and other little towns outside of San Francisco. So I knew a lot of the top guys. And I remember being a teenager and there was a, a guy named Barry Harmon who was a Caucasian guy who was really in with the Cook's people. And so he, they did a lot, travel did a lot of amazing demonstrations and it was inspiring. It was really kind of a performance art. One thing that I've been noticing, you mentioned the pain and stuff. Uh, you know, I I watch a lot of these. They do a lot of fall demonstrations and stuff. Yeah. And a lot of these kids, especially, you know, they're jumping up in the air and dropping from three feet onto a mat. And uh, I, it hurts me to look back on it. But <laughs> I know uh, as I've gotten older and with the hip replacements, I've had a couple spills. Uh, recently, I fell on some bikes and one of, one of the frames caught my nose. But overall... I haven't had any injuries from falling, and I attribute that to 10,000 break falls, you know, because judo and jujitsu and, and all martial arts at one point, if the instructor is experienced enough in it, will teach break falling. But I had a friend who had a business called Fail, Fall Safe, and he went around uh, contractually with power companies and such, teaching people how to fall properly. And I think uh, I often think of resurrecting that because, you know, I, we just had a neighbor friend who broke her hip falling and then she fell again in the hospital broke the other hip you know <laughs> i don't want to do that so break falling if you're good at it is a useful skill maybe the most useful skill that you get out of martial arts you know rather than punching somebody in the face you know uh, i am quite a clumsy person and uh as many times as i have fallen i i tend to get up relatively unharmed <laughs> yeah well you're still young and spry uh, so let's see here. Uh, what gets you up in the morning and coming in here to create? I create, uh, I get up in the morning to do the chores that everybody else does, but I'm thinking about making something. I'm thinking about the person that I'm portraying or the project I'm involved in. And I like to do a little background. I like to know who the person is and, uh, cause it often affects the colors you use or the way that you draw the lines, whether they're soft or aggressive. But I find that kind of mental activity uh, beats the heck out of scrolling through the news or getting yourself invested in politics, which I'm not immune to, but you know, it's my happy place. And so I want to make something. I want to start every project, just like I used to do. Every workout was a new beginning. Every opponent has got something that the other one didn't have, whether it be weight or some skill, innate skills. And so you just, you know, you bow in and you just check out what's happening and you react or uh, initiate your work based on how you're feeling and what the, what the person is telling you in the picture. You know, you do a picture of a tragic figure and it's different than one that, you know, has a career of happiness and joy and accomplishment, you know, you kind of got to play the game, but that, that occupying of your mental space with thinking about art is, I think it's the, it's the, uh, the sweet spot, you know, like in Japanese martial arts, they say, move from your hara, you know, your center, it's the center of the artist's life because you, you could be filling that space with so much, but, I think my motivation comes from wanting to make something that I don't want to throw up on, you know? <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned uh, that you just kind of decide on the images that you're going to create. Uh, where do you get the motivation to pick the different artists or the different subjects? Well, in my third grade class, coincidentally, was adjacent to the library of this elementary school I went to. And I started reading biographies, Marie Curie, her husband, Pierre, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff. And then my dad was a metallurgist and worked in a titanium plant. And when any of the equipment, uh, pipe, pipettes, flasks, beakers became a little acid stain, they couldn't use them anymore. They weren't accurate. So I had a huge li li uh, laboratory in my bedroom and I, he brought home a card file and I started uh, noting scientists and writing a little brief description of what they were known for. So Luther Burbank and, you know, uh, Asimov, uh, writers and scientists and artists. 
And so I became interested in who these people were, what they had done, and what obstacles. And that just has informed my art now as a 60-year-old. You know, I'm, I'm still fascinated by people and their stories. Lately, I've been reading about the abstract expressionists and their, the women of, there's a book out called uh, Night Street Women, which is about Lee Krasner and uh, Helen Frankenthaler and uh, de Kooning and, and just the lives they lived and the poverty they lived in, but their pursuit of art and the purity of it. And, you know, they, there was nobody buying there. You know, it's just a fascinating grassroots story of these people who became, you know, household words. And so uh, I forgot what the question was, uh, but I'm interested in people. And I think that the lino cut and uh, relief printing lends itself to bringing something to a, an image that a, photo a photograph doesn't offer. Photograph is a very fixed thing, but with all the chatter, the extra lines, the, the way you can slant lines or create curve or create an, a weird background, it brings the pictures to life in a way that I don't see in the photographs. And I like that. It's as if the person is captured in movement or uh, in changing light. And uh, photographs are very fixed, but Lino Cut gives you, or painting, gives you this ability to, to alter. And I love that alteration. I want to see something in the person that you can't see maybe when you're looking at them or in a photograph, but if you step back from one of these prints, you go, okay, there's the essence of the person. And then there's, there's this indication of movement and, and changing light. And yeah, I've seen that. And I've started to study people's faces, you know, in public settings. And I've noticed, you know, that I, I start looking more deeply at how people's faces are constructed and it's uh, informed my art. So I never get tired of that, or at least I haven't yet. Uh, so obviously your prints have layers to them and you have yeah. to cut out each of those different layers to do a different color. Uh, is that a difficult process for you? Or is it innate? How is... No, it takes some time. The first couple hundred prints I did were just one color and I was just trying to learn how to do eyes and noses. And then I said to myself, you know, okay, got to figure this color out. Cause with uh, Instagram and Facebook and such, you get to walk through an art gallery every day. You just, I think I follow 4,000 artists, you know? So I'm scrolling through looking at how people are doing their work and I, I got to get that down, you know? And so I started experimenting. And of course the first hundred are always crap, you know? And then, uh, then you start to have happy accidents and discoveries. And so I'm, now I'm starting to work on transparent colors, which I see a lot of artists do, but how do you do that? Well, you know, when you're looking at art, you know, when something isn't ready for prime time, if something's not right. The composition, the color, you know, something is wrong and you know that, but when you look at good art, you recognize, oh, something works about this. Even if it's an abstract of a chair or a person, color is, you know, I mean, I don't know how long, I guess some people are born with it, but for me, it's taken a lot of experimentation. And I, on a scale from white belt to black belt, I feel like I'm about a green belt right now. And I still have a lot to learn. And that's, that's exciting and interesting, you know, to have something that you're working on that you can do quietly, peacefully in a sort of meditative state. And a little bonus, you know, it, it's like uh, somebody, I heard somebody say one time, how long would you bowl if you didn't get to see the pins drop? You know, you wouldn't bowl very long. And that's how it is in printmaking. You pull that print up, you're not sure exactly if what you were thinking about is going to be translated. And sometimes you're disappointed and sometimes you go, I didn't see that coming. And that is really interesting, you know, and that's why I like to make art, you know, for the, for the meditation, for the surprises. And I like to, it gives me a chance to honor people too, because I mostly do upstanders, people who have made, done, stood up for things that I feel are important. So a lot of uh, activists and artists and writers and poets and, you know, people who looked at the world in a different way and brought something lovely to it. I used to be a, a cable installer and uh, now I'm a videographer, you know, so it's, it's a little bit of a shift. <laughs> uh, but this time around the college didn't feel quite as imperative to me, but I was trying to go back to learn some skills and I was more in like art history 101 type yeah. class. You know. It's it's hit and miss, you know, some of the, 
whenever you expose yourself to a large group of people, you're going to get all sorts of opinions. So uh, in my work, some people say, well, you're, you're copying photographs. I said, well, how do you, how do you create an image of somebody if you've never met them? You either, you know, you have to find something to look at that tells you this is how their nose was shaped and this and that. And, uh, there are, and, and so I've taken some of that criticism and there was some criticism in school. Everybody's got an opinion, but my thing is, you know, it doesn't matter. You practice. Practice by copying, practice by creating your own. Just keep practicing because you don't know what's going to come out of it. You really don't know. You're hoping and you're setting in a direction, but there's so many steps t- until you understand, oh, this color always works. This, These lines will be a perfect depiction of what I want this person's expression to be. And, you know, it just takes a while. You have to, some people are innately born with things. One of my students was a famous UFC fighter. His name is BJ Penn. And uh, I met him when he was 17. I had just moved to Hawaii and it wasn't three or four months and he was knocking me around pretty good. And I'm like, man, I, and I, by that time I'd been training 25 or 30 years, you know, and fortunately he became like a world champion and, and won the worlds in jujitsu. Uh, the only non-Brazilian ever to win in, in the black belt division. He had just got his black belt after two and a half years. It normally takes 10 or 15 years and nobody even scored a point on him. And they, they called him the prodigy. And uh, some people are born with skills that you can't explain. They play the piano, they make art, they're born with a great set of abs, but most of us have to work on it. And there's, so when I think about making art that transcends the nor- the ordinary, I think, you know, just keep practicing. You may never get it, but you'll certainly never get it if you don't put in the time and do the reps and continuously self-evaluate, you know, where am I coming from? What kind of feedback am I getting? And so I, that's how I approach my art. And I think every, every good artist who's really serious has some of that in them, it seems to me. At, uh, when I was at CWI before going to Boise State, uh, I took a drawing class and the teacher said, you know, he, he truly believes that everybody can draw as a, as a skill that you can learn, you know, rather than something innate. And I have always been the, oh, I can only draw stick figures, you know, kind of person. <laughs> uh, but by the end of that class, you know, uh, the final for it was all about, you know, taking like a, a real life thing and then doing the shading and the values and everything. And by the end of it, you know, I, I was really impressed by the drawing that I put together in my entire life. I've never considered my, I still don't consider myself a, 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 somebody that can draw. I, I can't, (laughs) I mean, if I sat down and practiced, I could, and I, I fully believe that now. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, uh, so many people think that art is innate. And I think that art is something that can be learned or can be taught, uh, maybe absolute skill can't, but you know, people can get better than they think they can. You know, there's something about compulsive behavior. You know, the, the book I was telling you, I'm reading the Ninth street women about uh, Joan Mitchell and Frankenthaler and all, they weren't selling their work. Nobody liked it. They were living in places without running water or electricity, sometimes in New York, you know, and, and, uh, they lived on $25 a month. They drank coffee, but they, they were driven in a way that I've seen in other activities, martial arts. You know, I, when I was trying to be in the Olympics, you know, there was no finances to help you. There was, you know, you weren't sure if you had the right coaches. You didn't know that you'd ever make it, but you certainly would never make it if you didn't try. And so you have to, if you find the thing that you can do, whether you make money or not, that you get enjoyment out of, be it filmmaking or, you know, uh, printmaking or painting or, uh, you know, uh, topiary work, you know, or you, whatever it is, if you find something you'll do, whether you make it or not, whether you fail or succeed, then I think you're, you've got a leg up, you know, you're going to pursue. So pursue it until you reach some level of skill, you know, and I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. If I never sold another piece or wasn't in a show anywhere, or I think I would still do it because there's just, 
it gives me something that nothing else that I found can replace, except really vigorous physical combat, you know, which I can't do now. I've had four hip replacements, broken jaw, broken collarbone, every finger, toe, you know, broken femur. You know, I just, you get to a point where you go, okay, you know, we spend so much time talking about not quitting that quitting anything becomes, you know, like a real guilt trip. So art gives me a place where I'm not quitting, where I recognize the the similarities between the physical art that I practiced for so many years and making art. And it's a, uh, it's an easy bridge to, to cross. And so I'm very lucky to have that. And I'm motivated by the practices, not the end result, which is watching the pins drop, which is wonderful, but the whole wind up, the swing, you know, and, and revisiting people who deserve some respect, you know, who, a lot of people have said, you know, I'm glad you put this little biography with this print because I'd heard the name, but I didn't know who it was. And I like that. You know, I like to be able to say this person, because there's so many bad examples today in, <laughs> if you watch the news, right, of human behavior. I like to pick these people out and say, well, you know, this person was remarkable for this. And that, and I get a lot of satisfaction out of that, uh, giving kudos to other people and, and, and we're revisiting the lives, you know, because they're gone, but they're not forgotten. And I try to make the prints of people who shouldn't be forgotten, who give us some hope and some examples of accomplishment and the best of what human beings can be and do. Do you feel there are any opportunities that you've had uh, that are specific to Boise? Well... Boise is kind of a remarkable town. You know, we lived, I lived in Hawaii and I often tell people oh, Hawaii is just like Boise, only different, but uh, it's clean. The, there's a lot of artists, it's safe. And in, and as a, as just a resident, I feel really comfortable here, but also uh, it has so many artists hiding, you know, in plain sight that you get a lot of support. You, you recognize, oh, these are my people. And so there's, Boise seems to be in a kind of an art town, you know, in a food town and a, a mountain town and, you know, river town. But there's something about Boise that's made, made me uh, more comfortable making here and dedicating myself to it. And you get a, there's a receptive audience and there seems to be, uh, people are awake to the, the natural beauty we have here and the, and the isolation, you know, we're so far from any other town that, you know, you better find something to do in Boise because <laughs> it's not like living in the Bay area where you can hit 15 towns in you know, two hours. But I, I think it's a good art town and there are people like you doing, you know, profiling people who are making, which inspires others and reinforces the beliefs and the, the artist you profile that, Hey, I might be on the right track. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there and it's a good thing. And so it's a community that seems to support artists and you can't ask for any more than that when you're trying to make stuff. Do you think that, uh, art is something that you'll ever stop doing? I don't know. Uh, once you immerse yourself in art and I know that every artist watching this might relate, everything becomes art. You know, uh, I know my wife was talking to you earlier and she said, uh, you know, now when I look at the hillside, I'm, I'm analyzing colors, you know, and I think being a martial artist, I didn't understand how much of that work was art, you know, that it, and I had an instructor, a, a famous instructor friend who said, you know, uh, martial arts is beautiful in all languages because it's about lines and circles and movement. And so if you're watching martial arts in uh, Egypt or Sweden or the United States, people who don't know the language or don't understand what you're doing recognize the beauty of lines that are proper, that line up in a certain way in circ circles. You know, it's just art, but it's a physical kind of art. And there's a real pragmatic part, like what if somebody tries to punch you in the face and then there's this, you're copying these moves that have been passed down from instructor to instructor and you're trying to bring something of yourself to it at the same time adhering to the formality of the work. So I think I've been an artist a long time. I just didn't know how to, you know, it's like martial artist. I had to separate the two. So when I talk about myself now, 
uh, for media, for promotion, I say martial plus artist. But I think uh, martial arts is a gateway drug to artists. You know, a lot of uh, famous Japanese artists became calligraphers. I mean, uh, martial artists became artists or calligraphers. And there's something about that expression and something about understanding how lines fixed mean something to people. It, it creates something that on a flat surface that becomes something more than just lines on a flat surface. So I think I've been a, an artist for a long time and I think that I may go to other mediums. I, I like painting and there's so many ways to make prints, you know, that I only know really are good at it one or two ways. And so there's a lot to learn. And I intend to go back to Boise State and continue working on my BFA. Uh, but I'm going to wait to turn 65 when, you know, the, the, the uh, tuition is cheaper. <laughs> Was there anything that you'd like to talk about that uh, I didn't ask you about? I'd like to talk about the people of Boise, uh, Prince. One of my recent projects has been uh, called People of Boise. I've done 11. I want to do a 12th print of a native Shoshone or a Bannock Paiute or, you know, I haven't found one yet, but it'll be a 12 part series. But some of them are kids. I, I met a kid named Oban at the, uh, the Raptor Center who was the youngest docent. You know, he's like 12 years old. And he's teaching you about these falcons and this and that. And I thought, I'm going to do one of him. And then we, I did the mayor and uh, did Sue Lata, who's a well-known local artist, taught some of my class up at the uh, university. But, uh, you know, I had a friend who uh, I was... After, just after 9-11, we had a, uh, you know, everybody was just in shock. And I remember listening to the president one day and he said, you know, one of the good things that have come out of this is the millions of acts of kindness that people have done for each other. And at that time, I worked with a large martial arts organization that taught school owners how to run their businesses better. And we had a couple thousand clients. And I thought, what's a million divided by a couple thousand with these schools having anywhere from 20 to 2,000 students? And I thought we could do a million acts of kindness. So I launched an acts of kindness program, the first one in the world where it was collected by a website that could track individual acts. And I had a, there were three of us, the web programmer, myself who championed the idea and a famous martial artist who was a friend of Bruce Lee. His name was Jun Ri. And uh, Jun Ri uh, worked in Washington, D.C. and he was lobbying to get 9-11 to be National Acts of Kindness Day. So he was, he knew all, he had run martial arts uh, programs in the congressional gym and taught, you know, they used to have Democrats versus Republican fight tournaments. It was funny. But I, one day I said, uh, Master Ree, uh, can we get Chuck Norris to help us with this? And he said, yeah, I think we can, but I'll have to put him in a place where he can't say no. And he said, by the way, if you ever really want somebody to do something for you, do so much for them that you can't. They can't say no when you ask them for something. And my people of Boise series, my secret ambition is, you know, to, to do so much for the city, to take time to profile those people who are extraordinary, young, old, any race, uh, because I want the city to blossom. You know, I want, to, I want to do my part. And when I finally ask the city to help me, you know, show this art or to do this, hopefully I've invested enough in the people around town that they'll go, yeah, I can't say no to that. And so it's it's a it's a win-win, you know, helping people in the community to tell their stories, what they're doing, and and at the same time, uh, you know, putting myself in a position where I get to talk to the mayor or, you know, meet people that are doers and movers and shakers. And I hope that my art uh, lives somewhere in Boise after I'm gone. Thank you for listening to my interview with Tom Kalos. If you'd like to learn more about artists working in the Boise region, be sure to check out our website, boiseartscene.com, or follow us on Instagram and Facebook. If you're in a position to help this project grow, you can find us on Patreon or reach out online. Boise Art Scene is recorded and edited by me, Morgan McCullum. Our social media accounts are managed by Katie Kloppenberg. Dia Bassett provides blog writing and consultation services. Thank you for listening.